Good evening and welcome. I'm Nicola Longford, CEO of the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. And on behalf of the staff and the board, we are absolutely delighted to welcome back the Dallas Theatre Centre and their fantastic team. And you're going to be on a wonderful journey learning about LBJ and the Great Society. And I'm deeply indebted to everyone on our panel, our illustrious panel, and also to the Dallas Theatre Centre. So please join me in welcoming this great, fabulous community partnership. Thank you, Nicola, and to all of the staff and our many friends at the Sixth Floor Museum who've been such great partners with us, uh, going all the way back several years ago to our production of All the Way. I'm Kevin Moriarty. I'm the Enlo Rose Artistic Director at Dallas Theatre Center. I am joined on the stage by Robert Schenken, the playwright of The Great Society. He is a winner of a Pulitzer Prize and a Tony Award and a three-time Emmy Award nominee. I'm joined by Dr. W. Marvin Delaney, who is an associate professor of history and interim director of the Center for African American Studies at the University of Texas at Arlington, and Lee Cullum, the host of CEO, KERA's monthly series of interviews with North Texas business leaders, a Dallas Morning News contributor, and a longtime journalist. We are going to start the evening with a brief moment from the play, The Great Society, Brandon Potter plays Lyndon Johnson. The Great Society rests on abundance and liberty for all. It demands an end to poverty and racial injustice. We need a program to ensure every American child a quality education. We need a national health insurance plan for our seniors. We need a national effort to improve our inner cities, and we need the elimination of every remaining obstacle to the right and opportunity to vote. And with those words, <laughs> with those words and more than a hundred bills that Lyndon Johnson introduced to Congress, the push for the visionary Great Society was off and running. Robert, it's amazing to me to look at this today, the modern age where a contemporary president, if they're uh, lucky, gets one or two signature pieces of legislation done. Uh, during their uh, terms in office to see the amount that Lyndon Johnson accomplished. How did he get so many bills turned into law so fast? Well, he had a super majority, which doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, he had a big majority in Congress, and uh, he also was an extremely uh, adept politician who recognized that a president actually has a very narrow window in which to get things done and that's, that's largely in the first year. Um, this is when your political capital is at its greatest before they've begun to tear you down. And if you're gonna get things done, you gotta get it done fast. And uh, I doubt that we have had a president since, and there've been very few presidents before him who had his legislative experience and acumen. And that, that just meant everything. Uh, we have seen uh, in our own time um, how uh, well-intentioned presidents have not succeeded because they don't have that legislative experience. Uh, and, and even currently, we see the kind of chaos that uh, we're currently experiencing in Congress with uh, an executive leader who doesn't really have a lot of experience or understanding of how legislation works. To get legislation accomplished, uh, ideological purity can be a real... Um, uh, uh, problem uh, since it's hard to get compromise if you're not willing to compromise. Lee, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how LBJ was able to bring progressive legislation uh, to bear and still manage to compromise with the folks who, uh, who weren't quite as progressive as Lyndon Johnson was. Well, it was extraordinary. You know, this was a Southern uh, senator after all who had not been all that good on civil rights. I guess his motto was, and he said this himself, a half a loaf, ha, huh, a slice of GD bread uh, <laughs> would make him happy. But, uh, you know, I'm sure that Robert came across this and probably has written about it, but the night of JFK's funeral, LBJ searched all over the country for Martin Luther King Jr. He could find anybody anywhere, in a restaurant, a hotel, anywhere. He found Martin Luther King Jr. It was in Boston or New York. Uh, he was up there meeting with compatriots, and they were very upset because Johnson had not a very good record in the Senate. He had been a Southern senator, that was that. Uh, they expected very little. 
Uh, Johnson said to King, I intend to pass the civil rights bills. I'm going to do it. He then got on the phone to Kay Graham. They were bottled up, the voting rights bill, and uh, public accommodations, open housing. Uh, they were bottled up in committee. These were Southern senators bottling them up in committee. You would know all about that, Dr. Delaney. Uh, and so he said to Kay Graham, help me get these out. She said, I'll do it. She did. Uh, he called Richard Russell, senator of Georgia, over to meet with him. He was in the pool, probably in the nude, was in the nude. Uh, poor, poor Dick Russell had to sit there. And, and he said, I'm going to pass these bills. And Russell said, you will kill the Democratic Party in the South. And Nelson Johnson said, I know. And he did it. I, I think he truly cared. Uh, there's nothing like the believing party who's also willing to get, take what he can get. And, of course, Johnson in the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, had an immensely important ally in Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And one thing that strikes me about that is that at the same time that LBJ is working the inner parts of the Democratic and Republican Party in the halls of Congress, Reverend King is out there uh, working the, with the folks in the movement and changing popular uh, consciousness at the, at the grassroots level. Uh, talk about that interplay between what's happening out in the communities around the country that, where King and the SCLC are working versus what's happening in the halls of power in Washington, sure. uh, Dr. Lane. Um, you know, if you've seen the, the film Selma, and, and they do it well, and of course the, the play also does this well in terms of showing what's happening on the ground in Selma, Alabama, what's happening in Mississippi, and how King is sort of building uh, a constituency and support for the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, by tr trying to raise the consciousness uh, not only of the people in the Civil Rights Movement, but the consciousness of the nation. And you know, and there's a line in that in the film Selma, uh, where where LBJ says to, to the actor playing King, um, "Make me do it," and <laughs> meaning indeed do the protests and the demonstrations at the grassroots level, so that you know I, I have no choice as well as Congress has no choice but to pass this legislation. Yeah, yeah there's a there's a, a <clears throat> moment in Robert's play as well where. Uh, I, Johnson says, I need you to keep up the pressure. One, one of the things I, I just want to piggyback on what, what was just said is that um, all too often I think people undervalue and underrecognize King's extraordinary political instincts. He was, he was a brilliant political leader and, and he is simultaneously as uh, LBJ trying to wrangle a large, contentious and very diverse group of individuals who share general goals and some specific goals, but differ very strongly on how to go about achieving it. And, and his ability to uh, wrangle uh, these individuals and keep them moving in the same direction for as long as he did is, is really a remarkable thing. And, and the relationship then and collaboration between the two of them for this very brief moment of time, because of course this all falls apart in 1966, uh, uh, 67 over Vietnam, but this handful of years that they were that they worked together, they were able to achieve so much. Mm -hmm. In the same way that it's easy to it's easy today to think of the Democratic Party um, monolithically uh, as the party of progressive values and of uh, uh, civil rights, the the uh, party whose whose uh, has near unanimity on that, and yet, Lee, in the 1960s, that's not how folks in Texas, or even in much of the South, uh, all of the South perhaps, would have thought of, would have defined the Democratic Party. What changed and at what cost? Well, the Democratic Party at that time, in the 1960s, shall we say, the Johnson era, was split. There was a conservative party led by a guy named Alan Shivers, uh, Oh, well, he had been. He was a governor. He was the one who took Texans into the Eisenhower camp in 1952, and again, perhaps in 1956. I think he was still governor. He was certainly active. Uh, and then there was the Ralph Yarborough wing of the party. LBJ and JFK, mainly John Kennedy, came to Texas in November, the November 22nd, to try to heal the rift between Yarborough and the and the Johnson John Connolly wing of the party, and. Uh, so what happened was there were a group of there was a group of Dallasites, Peter and Edith O'Donnell, 
uh, Duncan and Elizabeth Beckman, Dick and uh, Rita Bash, she became Rita Clements, and there were others uh, who took it upon themselves to, to allure, lure those conservative Democrats into the Republican Party. And it began in the election of 1960. Uh, they, they, would, they would get people and they would put them on buses, all their friends from Highland Park, and uh, they would give them a box lunch and they would go, a man and a woman, because uh, householders would feel more comfortable if that's who came to the door and rang the bell. And they would say, we hope you'll vote for Bruce Alger, and so forth, and, uh, and Richard Nixon in that year. And uh, over time, they managed to get the conservative Democrats, and correct me if you, where I'm wrong here, sure. Dr. Delaney, get them into the Republican Party, and they succeeded. Uh -huh. And so the, the Democratic Party was left with the Ralph Yarborough wing, which wasn't enough uh, to carry the election. Uh, after, uh, I guess, Jimmy Carter was the last Democrat to carry the presidential election in Texas in 1976. Yeah. Dr. Laney, I'm curious, was it a foregone, today it seems uh, like perhaps a foregone conclusion that the vast majority of African American voters uh, vote very strongly for Democrats. Was that, was that indeed uh, predestined, as it were, in the 1950s and the early 1960s? Uh, no, it was not, um, mainly because, and I'll just be very frank, the Democratic Party was the party of the arch racists in the, in the South in particular, and I'm going to come around back to this question in a roundabout way, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, one of the things that sort of distinguishes Johnson from, so let's say, Roosevelt, you know, we have to put maybe those two in the top five, uh, Roosevelt went along with the racists in the Democratic Party in the 1930s and 40s with the New Deal and therefore excluded most African Americans from Social Security, from minimum wage, and so on. Uh, Johnson fought for those, the, those things so that African Americans would have full rights. So what happens is, of course, uh, African Americans do begin to, f to flip from being primarily Republicans, hearkening, hearkening back to the great emancipator Abraham Lincoln, and in the 30s, we, st we see this switch gradually where African Americans start becoming more democratic. But still in the 50s and in the 60s, there are African Americans, a lot of African Americans who are still Republicans. Ironically, and I'll say this, uh, self-exposure here, my father was a Republican and voted for Eisenhower. Okay, so, but in 1960, he voted for Kennedy. So, so uh -huh. basically, we, we see this gradual s switch so that in the 60s and 70s, indeed, African Americans become 80, 90 percent Democrat. I, I think it, it bears repeating that the hinge for this, the impetus is, is race. Yes. This is what happens to the switch in the two parties. Right. The signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, mm -hmm. followed in 1965 by the Voting Rights Act, drives conservative so. Southern Democrats into the Republican Party. Right. Simultaneously, under the Barry Goldwater uh, purge in San Francisco at the San Francisco Convention, they literally purge the Republican Party of the remaining black and tan mm -hmm. members. They really drive, they literally drive out African American members. So it's, mm -hmm. that's where it switches, and it's about race. Yeah. Race is the driving force. It's just so fascinating, a moment where, that we're in today where there's at least the potential that there could be coming in the next uh, a decade or so, uh, a realignment of uh, some political parties in American life. It's fascinating to go back at this moment in time and both All the Way and The Great Society uh, uh, dramatize this moment where the Democratic Party is very, very um, consciously and at times painfully, violently mm -hmm. shifting its mm -hmm. understanding of its own, its own values that um, characters who are the most virulent in their racism. Mm -hmm. uh, George Wallace perhaps would be the character on stage who's the most overt about that in the plays, are Democrats, which is a very interesting uh, thing for modern, you know, for, for younger folks today, that's kind of surprising to see. Just as it is, you know, it's worth keeping in mind, however, that the civil rights movement itself doesn't meet its Waterloo in the South. It meets it in Boston and Chicago, northern cities. This is where the, the movement falters against white Democratic voters who are extremely resistant to integration in their schools and their neighborhoods. That's where the civil rights movement crashes. 
Mayor Daley, the, the all-powerful mayor of Chicago, figures prominently in the Great Society, uh, and th this fault line is exactly uh, Daley versus King is um, among the more powerful oppositional relationships in the play. Dr. Delaney, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how the movement uh, had to change when the movement moved north into, uh, into Chicago and the other northern cities. Sure. In fact, uh, one of the nuances of the play that I really like is um, you're showing that conflict between Daly and uh, Johnson and King, more specifically, over the block grants that came from the, the, the War on Poverty programs. Literally, in many cases, those who were in the movement would get the money from the Office of Economic Opportunity under um, the Community Action Agency program, and indeed, use those monies to, to mobilize the community against the, the dailies and against the bosses in these urban areas. And so that's, that, so that's right on the money. Uh, in, in Dayton, for example, Dayton, Ohio, um, the, the community action agency was run by a guy by the name of um, Roger Preer. He called himself the prime minister. He had gotten uh, maybe a $3 million block rent under the OEO funds and basically began trying to build an empire to, to challenge the city mayor, to challenge the Democratic Party, to get more African Americans involved, involved and engaged in politics. Uh, unfortunately, in Chicago, most of the black politicians were in Daly's pocket, but in Dayton and in Columbus and some of the other cities, uh, they use anti-poverty funds to build a, a foundation, a base. Just like Daly was using those funds to pay his supporters' pay patronage, well, some of the African American groups did the same thing in some of the other cities to challenge the system. And so, indeed, that split the civil rights movement in two in, in a lot of the major cities in this country. I want to move us uh, <clears throat> forward to one of the great shining moments of the Johnson administration. The Voting Rights Act of 1965. And to do that, I'm going to turn back to our Lyndon Johnson, Brandon Potter. Today I deliver my voting rights bill to Congress. Rarely does an issue lay bare the heart of America itself. There is no Southern problem. There is no Negro problem. There is only an American problem. The failure of America to live up to its unique founding purpose, all men are created equal. There is no constitutional issue here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue here. It is wrong to deny your fellow Americans a right to vote. There is no issue of states' rights. There is only the issue of human rights. The real hero of this struggle is the American Negro. His actions and protests, his courage to risk safety and even to risk his life have awakened the conscience of this nation. But their cause must be our cause too, because it is not just Negroes, but really it is all of us who must overcome this crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice, and we shall overcome. <laughs> It is, um, I have always understood uh, history, at least American history, as moving forward and ever expanding its notions of freedom and justice, and yet it nearly brings tears to my eyes to hear those words and to imagine a president of the United States saying those words on the floor of Congress, because frankly, in my lifetime, I can't imagine a Democrat or Republican uh, leader who would speak with that. There, there is no issue of states' rights. There is only human rights. Like the thought of, of any political leader speaking to both houses of Congress that directly and with such moral authority is, um, it's very moving to me. Lee, I'm struck by the fact, what, what would that have been like in 1965 that the man saying those words was not just a white man, he was a Texan, and he was a Texan from a state that had a complicated and crippling uh, relationship with um, racism? Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting question, and I do think that uh, 
seeing both your plays, Robert, uh, it certainly comes through to me that this was a tragic hero. I mean, tragic because of the war in Vietnam, but also quite heroic. And I want to express it with uh, a story that Lloyd Benson told. You all may remember Senator Lloyd Benson, a fine, fine Democratic senator, maybe our last Democratic senator. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, in any event, he told a story. This was a story he told to a housing convention here in Dallas. Uh, he was on a plane with LBJ a little plane, and they were flying over some of the suburbs of Dallas and sort of some ticky-tacky houses and people making fun of the ticky-tacky houses. And he said, you listen to me. For every one of those little houses, it represents a step up. And he cared about that. Uh, he cared about it. And I, and I think he put himself on the line over and over for it. And then uh, the tragedy is it, uh, it all got swept away with this terrible misjudgment in foreign policy, which he never understood. Robert, what's your sense of why Lyndon Johnson, a uh, white Texan, why, why, did, why was he the president, not, not John Kennedy before him, why was he the president who um, stepped forward in, that, in regard to race? Well, you know, um, part of it was his background. He, uh, he grew up in rural Texas and in very real poverty. His family lost all their money when he was very young. And, uh, and Lyndon Johnson knew what it was like to go without, to be hungry. Um, and, and that made an enormous impression on him. He also uh, knew what it was like to be looked down upon, to be looked at as other because, for class reasons. And I think that it gave him an, an ability to understand in a way that few white politicians had understood what African-American men and women had been suffering in America for 200 years. So he was, he was sympathetic at a core personal level, I think, to that struggle and that sense of injustice. Um, I think also, you know, it must be said that uh, he certainly had his eye on history and he wanted to, to leave his mark. He was, a, he was a Roosevelt New Dealer, this idea that the federal government existed to make citizens' lives better really resonated with him, and he felt that, uh, that he was carrying forward uh, the work of his hero, um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So I think all of these things combined, I, I, I think in some ways it had to be a Southerner. It had to be somebody who actually lived in a mixed population and interacted on a daily basis with men and women of color mm -hmm. um, to, to have that kind of understanding and sympathy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Delaney, one of the things that is striking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is that there even was the need for such a thing because nearly 100 years earlier, in 1870, the 15th mm -hmm. Amendment to the Constitution was passed, which is a constitutional right to for citizens to be able to vote without regard to mm -hmm. race. It's explicit in that amendment. So what, what was going on in American life, and especially in the South, that was preventing the Constitution from being in full effect? <laughs> wow. Uh that's a full lecture. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can... That's the time you got. America. I'm going to see if I can narrow it down. You know, the, the, indeed, the 15th Amendment said that the, the right to the vote shall not be abridged by race, creed, or previous condition of servitude. But, of course, those of us who know our American history know that poll taxes were passed, white primaries were passed, grandfather clauses were passed, uh, a whole a host of violent acts were used to drive African Americans and Mexican Americans from the polls in most places in the South. You know, we had the discussion uh, earlier while we were in the green room. Green room, excuse me. Uh, Y'all weren't privy to that con to that, uh, uh, that conversation. But we talked about the white primary here in Texas and how there were five, well, four cases that start one in 27, 32, 35 until that case was uh, until the white primary was struck down in the state in 1944. But there was still the poll tax. And then there were still threats of economic and violence and intimidation to keep people from voting. So Johnson, indeed, was, had, had to pass this Voting Rights Act, again, because of what happened at Selma, as well as in other places in the South, to, uh, to allow people to vote without the, well, actually, to get the federal government to actually enforce the, the 15th Amendment of the, of the Constitution. Uh, and again, 
literally sending registrars into the South so that Texas registrars couldn't block people from registering to vote. It's worth <clears throat> noting that um, mm -hmm. Johnson, as the, as the leader of the executive branch, not only got this law passed in 65, but put the full muscular weight of the federal yeah. government at its service to make it happen. Yeah. He put teeth into the law, which is what you needed. You can't just pass a law and assume that everything is going to be hunky-dory. Yeah. And he understood that and put real effort into it. And the, the, the real tip-off here to how critical that is, if you look at the Supreme Court decision of, what is it, just two years ago, which essentially invalidated the, uh, one of the critical parts of that 65 law, which set up a uh, voting uh, federal board of oversight, essentially, yeah. Yeah. for uh, a number of states that, uh, mostly southern states, but not exclusively southern states, that had practiced Jim Crow law. Excluding. As soon as they, that was eviscerated by this Supreme Court decision less than two years ago, we have seen a s upsurge in state actions, state after state, in all of these states, new laws essentially reimposing restrictions, making it harder to vote, moving us back towards Jim Crow. And that's because that federal oversight ball was eviscerated by Supreme Court decision. And Robert, that's why these plays of yours are so important. Uh, everything we say on the stage at the Theater Center today is in danger. All those bills are in danger. It's really striking to pick up a newspaper, turn on the television, and hear that the Supreme Court of the United States is considering, again, these fundamental questions about the right to vote, and that that's a pretty active part of the dialogue on uh, both sides of the cable TV channels. Uh, it's, yeah. And it's not in code. It's explicit that yeah. people are talking about either how do we restrict or how do we expand. Yes, voter, voter fraud, as if there were any. No states reported any that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, the, um, one of the uh, other things, well, so I want to I go back, Dr. Delaney, to ask about Selma specifically, but also the, the other um, events that were happening on the ground throughout the South at the time. Mm -hmm. There were lives lost. I mean, there was a there was a, a war going on, a battle for the the soul of America, and that was a not a metaphorical battle. It was it was literally done with uh, uh, rocks and water cannons and guns and and dogs and mm -hmm. and lynchings and the, all of yeah. those tools. What impact did those the activists who were in the streets? have on the broader American support for or, or, or support against uh, uh, the, the civil rights bills? Sure. One of the in interesting things that, you know, when we study the civil rights movement, you know, we, we study it from the perspective that it was uh, this nonviolent sort of social consciousness movement. But as you just sort of mentioned already, it was very violent. People lost their lives. People got beaten up. People got put in, put in jail. People lost their jobs uh, for participating in the movement. So one of the, of course, one of the key events was the Children's March in um, Montgomery, excuse me, Birmingham, in, in 1963, where indeed all the children poured out of the schools and marched to Kelly Ingram Park, and of course the police and the fire uh, department active, cr acted very crazy and used fire hoses and police dogs to attack these children. And again, everybody in the world saw that. And they said, what kind of country is the United States of America that uses fire hoses and police dogs on children? So indeed, uh, King uh, actually didn't agree with that strategy, by the way, but you know, he, he came to see how effective it was in, indeed in raising social consciousness and building this outrage in the country over the denial of basic civil rights uh, for, for African Americans in the South. It's, it's amazing how powerful <clears throat> these images were, and particularly as expressed through television. Yeah. Um, the, uh, sun, the Bloody Sunday uh, attack at the Pettus Bridge yeah. uh, was brought to the attention of white America um, by a newscast. Newsreel footage had been uh, secreted out of the the event uh, by some very brave correspondents uh, literally got in a car and drove it straight to New York 
and it aired um, in the it was a it was a, a what do you call it a, we we break into we, we break a bulletin late breaking bulletin in the middle of of us of the first television screening of Judgment at Nuremberg. Mm. Oh my goodness. In the middle of Judgment of Nuremberg, mm -hmm. all right, where we're watching the Nazi hierarchy come to grips with what they did, suddenly they break in with the footage of Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. And white America sits there in their living room watching African American men, women, and children be brutally beaten by Alabama State Police. And, and there it was. You could no longer pretend that this was, wasn't happening. You can no longer tell yourself, oh, well, that's a Southern thing, mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. you, whatever you told yourself. Yeah. You, you cannot underestimate the shock value and how that precipitated, how it galvanized people. And it was the sacrifice, yeah. the, the literal physical blood and flesh sacrifice of these individuals, many, many of them students, as you say, were yeah. leaders in this movement that made that happen. That in conjunction with television as this new medium by which you could mobilize people. Uh, Robert has already um, uh, mentioned, uh, uh, talked about Martin Luther King as a great political uh, uh, leader as well as a, a moral leader. King's political skills were put to test by the mid-1960s um, to the extreme as his own uh, uh, coalition, the folks inside of the movement to start to split away in the play. The play dramatizes this um, largely through the character of Stokely Carmichael and the rise of black power and the, the growing rejection of, of nonviolence uh, and, and King's strategy. Dr. Delaney, I'm, I'm curious to hear how that split came about and mm -hmm. how that impacted sure. The movement as it moved forward into the, the sure. North in the later years of the 60s. Yeah, that's one of the great nuances in the plays that, that, in the play that I like, in that uh, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which had been formed primarily by college students uh, they, in, in 1960. Uh, in 1962, they were engaged in this campaign in Georgia, uh, voting rights campaign, and King came to town, got arrested, and, and sort of disrupted what they were trying to do because uh, the media followed him and, and he left and that, and that left some bitterness in, in, in their uh, bitter taste in their mouth that King, and in fact they started calling King the Lord uh, <laughs> to make fun of how he you know, was this charismatic figure and everybody thought that everybody should line up behind King and follow his philosophy of nonviolence, which they did indeed. They named the organization the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Yet uh, they Thought. In fact, they, they criticized King because they said he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He would not come to Mississippi, um, and, and some of the other places in the South where they were indeed catching hell. So this split happens because they thought King was trying to lead the movement in a direction where he was going to be this sort of charismatic leader and ignore the the, the need for organizing the people on the grassroots level so that they can take control of their own lives. Indeed, voting rights. He, they thought was was more important than just a march and demonstration. In fact, as you know, as you show, as you show in, the, in the play, they pulled out of uh, Selma. They didn't, they didn't think the Selma march was a good idea because they thought it was just a, a media event and, then, and everybody would go home and they still would not have registered people to vote, which they thought was the most important thing. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm being long. Then, of course, eventually, and again, I, I love the fact that uh, you use the Montgomery to Jackson march in, in, in 1966, where indeed Stokely Carmichael gives the Black Power speech yeah. and indeed severs the, the ties with King in terms of nonviolence and, and pursues uh, basically armed self-defense, saying that we've been trying to love these folks for years and they're still shooting and killing us and beating us. Uh, what uh, intelligent hu human being does that? And so indeed, the, the split occurs because they basically said, we're going to adopt armed self-defense. We'll be nonviolent with those who are nonviolent with us. And of course, there's the influence of Malcolm X, but I won't get into that. Right. But, uh, you know, we're going to meet violence with violence. 
It is a, a it, it is a it is a tragic yeah. moment, an entirely understandable moment yeah. of the frustrations of yeah. of these young people who had put their lives on the line and see their friends badly hurt in some cases killed, and the and the, the movement begins to shatter. We we forget mm -hmm. how by the end of '68, King is really um, you know not a popular figure anymore, not even among his own movement. And when he comes out against the war, then. He is nationally reviled, nationally reviled, yeah. and it's it's not until after the assassination and the martyrdom that that begins sure. to shift. But uh, towards the end of his life, you know, he is he is really struggling there in the wilderness. And what's amazing to me, what's amazing to me is how what he comes to then is the broadening of his mission and this idea. You know, it's not just about race; it's class yeah. in this country the poor people's march. We've got to, we've got to get everybody together. Sure. Black, white, red, brown, who are, who are disenfranchised in this system and, and march together. That's where the focus needs to be. It's, it's remember, an, amazing, an amazing evolution. I remember hearing Jim Lehrer, uh, who covered the assassination for the Times Herald on November 22, 1963, say at that moment when uh, King was uh, really uh, facing great opposition and great problems because of his opposition to the Vietnam War. Jim said, he's run out of options. And when you run out of options, you cease to be a leader. And it became a problem, I yes. think. Yes. And one other thing, of course, in his last book, as you pointed out, you know, he is sort of in, in turmoil. The last book, of course, is where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Mm -hmm. And of course, basically, he used all the examples of, from the civil rights movement of, of the failures in, in, in many cases where the country had made uh, indeed significant changes, but, in, but not the basic economic changes that was going to lead to progress for all Americans. It, it's such a tragic loss that we weren't the beneficiaries as the American people of King living out a long, full life as a political and thought leader in the country because it would have been, it would be so interesting for us to see how he would have continued to evolve in his thinking and how he would have been able to, or, or not perhaps, but be able to galvanize a coalition around those, yeah. those thoughts. Um, uh, uh, Lee, in the same way that, that uh, King is facing a, a challenge uh, from his left, I suppose it would be with Stokely, Lyndon Johnson is facing a challenge inside of his own party um, with uh, most notably Bobby Kennedy, uh, uh, how did that uh, rift develop and, uh, and play out in the later years of the 60s? Well, of course, uh, there was a lot of bitterness between them uh, on both sides. Uh, LBJ detested Bobby Kennedy, got rid of Bill Moyers, his uh, son, really, the only son he ever had besides his sons-in-law, because Bill Moyers went to parties over at Hickory Hill, which is Bobby Kennedy's estate, and uh, Bobby Kennedy went off to run Newsday because it that just teed off Lyndon Johnson. He was terrified of Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy, I think, had disdain for LBJ and uh, didn't really want to offer him the vice presidency. Remember, he said, I kind of offered it, and he took it. Bobby never wanted him to take it, didn't intend for him to take it. He did. And uh, so it was deep, deep enmity. And, uh, and then, of course, there was uh, Senator Fulbright uh, of Arkansas. Remember the Fulbright hearings on the Vietnam War? This was a Southern senator uh, also. Uh, very damaging to the war. And then the, the foreign policy elite began to fall away. And uh, he was left quite alone with the dealmaker Clark Clifford, who's in your play, to try to work things out. And he did it pretty well, I think. And Well, not that well. He handed it off to Nixon, who lost 25,000 more lives. This leads us inevitably to the most tragic element of the Johnson presidency. And for one last time, I'm going to turn us back to Brandon Potter as Lyndon Johnson. They're driving me to Andrews Air Base in my big custom-built Lincoln Continental, one that's armored like a tank. There's a rally on the sidewalk, and the police are keeping the anti-war protesters apart from this big group of construction workers, both sides yelling and screaming obscenities at each other with the police stuck in between. Suddenly this girl, this girl couldn't have been but 17, 18, Lucy's age. This girl 
breaks through the police line and throws herself against the car. Now, she couldn't weigh 100 pounds soaking wet, but she hit the side of the car like a linebacker. Claw in the door. Secret Service are on her immediately, but for a split second, her face is smashed against a window with this look. This look of such hatred. Eyes rolling back in her head, face twisted, spit running down her chin, blood on the glass as she yells at me over and over again to die. Just die. Just die, why don't you? Lyndon Johnson was... <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was reviled and hated for the war that he knew he couldn't win, didn't want to fight, but nonetheless persisted in plunging the nation deeper and deeper into. Robert, why did Lyndon Johnson feel the need for us to be in and stay in Vietnam? Well, that's a $64,000 question, isn't it? Um, you know, in, in this, uh, it, it needs to be kept in mind that he was uh, pursuing a line of American foreign policy that had begun with Truman. Um, and it was all predicated on this notion of um, resisting and, uh, and beating back communist expansion, the so-called domino theory. Um, there was a very, the Cold War was a real thing. Um, communism as a threat was a real thing. So you can't just dismiss it blithely, but everyone, uh, in, almost everyone, in a leadership position in the United States in the 50s and early 60s completely misunderstood what the geopolitical situation was in Vietnam, that Ho Chi Minh, uh, who had begun uh, as an ardent admirer of the United States, and indeed the Constitution he wrote is based in part on the United States Constitution, and, uh, and the understanding that he had made uh, with Roosevelt in World War II that his help, Ho's help, in um, retrieving downed U.S. airmen behind lines, behind Japanese lines, would result in the United States supporting their nationalist effort. And then, of course, after the war, uh, Truman is now president, and he sides with our French allies mm -hmm and restores them to power in Vietnam, and thus begins the tragedy of Vietnam. Uh, LBJ knew as early as November 1964, you can listen to a phone conversation. This is publicly available. Go online, University of Virginia, um, between LBJ and Senator Russell, in which LBJ says, you can't win in Vietnam. You can't win in Vietnam, and I don't know how to get out of Vietnam. I don't know what to do. And that really was pretty much how he saw it, because he saw it, as they all did, as a domestic issue, a domestic political issue instead of a foreign political issue. How will I be received if I am the president who loses Vietnam? Look what they did to Truman when he lost China. And, and this bedeviled administration after administration, mm -hmm. it, is, it is one of the drawbacks of, an, of a political system in which the national leadership changes every four or at least every eight years um, because you don't want to be that guy on whose watch that happens. And um, for all, he would have been the first to say foreign policy is not, my, not the thing I feel most comfortable in, it's not the thing I really love to do, and he just couldn't see his way. He, he thought he could maybe beat them to the table, and if he could just get them in a room, because he was such a great deal maker, he could make a deal with them. He was going to give them a Mekong Delta hydroelectric project that would make the TVA look like a bathtub. <laughs> but that's not what they were interested in. They weren't interested in electricity. And on that failure to understand, um, the tragedy of Vietnam continues and, and will continue for another seven years under the peace president, Richard Nixon. <laughs> Lee, this is part of what I find looking back at that time so confusing is that whereas in the area of civil rights, for instance, you see the, uh, the views of middle class Americans changing and as the views change, the politicians take greater action. 
in response to the will of the people. But in response to Vietnam, as the American people turned against the war, not only did Johnson continue to fight the war, but then he's followed by a president in the opposite party who plunges us ever deeper into war for another four plus years. Why couldn't the American political leadership respond to the American people in that moment in time? Well, we see the same thing now, don't we? I mean, don't we see poll after poll on various issues that I won't uh, elaborate on, <laughs> where the people feel one way and... Uh, a, majority, very, a vast majority of precisely, the people feel one way. And uh, I, don't you think it has to do with, with interests of one kind or another? Uh, and, and in the case of Vietnam, uh, you know, Nixon was a foreign policy president. Johnson yeah. was not. Nixon was actually, in terms of the opening to China, a brilliant foreign policy president, it seems to me. But uh, uh, very, very strange that he insisted on, uh, on continuing the war. Part, part of what happens here, and it's one of the terrible legacies of this, this time period, is that the American people lose faith in the American government. This is, this is where that happens. Mm -hmm because they are lied to by so many administrations on this, on this very issue repeatedly, over and over again. Um, and, and the impulse is eventually um, irreversible uh, among the people to be out. But by the time we are, the damage has been done. And we live with this damage to this day, this, this mistrust of the federal government um, you know, dates really, I think, from, from the Vietnam conflict. Dr. Delaney, in the early 1960s, uh, Martin Luther King did not speak uh, publicly in any significant way about the war in Vietnam. But in 1967 at Riverside Church, mm -hmm. he steps forward with a speech that is just stunning even to this day to, yeah. to read where he comes out unequivocally in opposition to the war. What changed for King in his understanding of the war and, how, and what impact did that speech have on uh, the, uh, Americans' understanding of the war? Well, one of the things, uh, of course, was since he was an advocate of nonviolence and he's trying to preach to Americans about the, that nonviolence is a strategy much better than violence, because basically, if you p pursue violence, all you're going to end up doing is killing a lot of people. So he, of course, says in that speech that the United States of America is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And so basically, he was trying to make the argument that if we're going to argue for nonviolence in terms of the strategy of the Civil Rights Movement, we need to internationalize that and honor and argue for nonviolence consistently throughout out the world. And, and basically, he sort of prodded Johnson or said to Johnson that you need to seek a peace agreement, that we're sending a message to our, our, our own people that while we are advocating nonviolence at home, we're, we're killing all these people in Vietnam and having our own citizens and soldiers killed uh, abroad for reasons that is unclear. Yeah. In many ways, that seems like, whereas earlier in the plays, Johnson and King are both work using their political skills to make step-by-step -step advancements in things they believe. It seems like toward the end of the play that they split in pretty significant way and that yeah. King manages to speak with a moral authority and mm -hmm. truthfulness even when that is going to certainly cost him as it did sure. his relationship with the president. Uh, Johnson did not even go to King's funeral. Right. Um, so it, at, at political risk, it seems that, sure. that King steps forward, whereas Johnson in that moment in time just can't quite find his way toward yeah. a moral clarity right. above his political risk. Yeah, Robert p pointed out uh, very um, accurately that King became this reviled, hated person in the latter part of his life, primarily because of his stance on uh, Vietnam. He was indeed... Um, told he was being unpatriotic, and in fact told that this was an area that he shouldn't even talk about. Well, we're not he's, but the po political oh, establishment, wow. right. yes, did not, uh, not ex right. Well, which people? 
there were there were there were a lot of there were a, lo a lot of Americans at the time who really took issue with King on this. Yeah, yeah. there were a lot on each. It was very polarizing. Yes, but I think he was. I, I think he knew he would pay a political cost in terms of his relationship with Johnson. I don't think he anticipated the cost uh, uh, personally sure. and within his own movement. Uh, there were a lot of people who felt politically this was a disastrous uh, decision on his part, uh -huh. uh, and, and it cost him a lot, but he, at this point he had reached a point where he felt, no, this was really a moral, a moral stance, a Christian yeah. stance. You yeah. could but, not be a Christian but Robert, and, and it seemed, ignore this. I'm sorry, it seems to me that your play does show that uh, he saw his own objectives for his own people being obliterated by the war. Uh, there's no question um, about they it. They couldn't get anywhere. Johnson couldn't get them anywhere. It was, uh, you know, very largely, predominantly, uh, men of color were dying in Vietnam, not white men. Uh, so there was that. Mm -hmm. There was the fact that the, Viet the costs of the Vietnam War, which were enormous, mm -hmm. were eating up all the money that was supposed to go to great society programs. Mm -hmm. And now people who were, I'm sorry? Mm -hmm. um, uh, all that funding that was intended to support those programs, now if you were opposed to those programs, you could attack them safely by saying, well, it's an economic issue. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to these programs, but you can't have guns and butter. You know, you, know, you can't have it all. And we've got, a, we've got this war now, so we just can't possibly afford this. And this, this became the cudgel that was used to demolish the Great Society. And he needed to end the war to get the Great Society going again. That, and this is where the tragedy comes in play. Now, of course, one thing that as a, as a theater guy, I always think, oh, when the events happening on a stage start causing the audience to uh, 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 well, leap to their yes. feet and start responding, that means something good is happening in the play. And in this conversation, that's organically happening. So we are going to wrap up this conversation and invite you to join us for a brief reception. And in doing that, I invite you to join me in thanking our very esteemed panelists. Thank you. I very much hope to see you at the theater with the Great Society. Good night. <laughs>